All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in again. This is episode 19 of the Misplaced series by Living Farms. This is a series of 20 episodes, so we're almost at the end. And in these episodes, in this series, we discuss issues of sustainability, mostly in the food systems. Today is going to be a little bit different, and we'll get to that soon. But we hear from you know different entrepreneurs, advocates, experts about these issues of sustainability and what we can do to solve them. So if you're interested in seeing more of our episodes of the upcoming one and the old ones, sign up through the link in description and you'll receive them via email. So as I mentioned, today's topic is pretty unique and may look a little bit separate or different from the conversations we had around food. Uh, but we are really, really excited to have Sally on board today and to hear about uh, fashion and food and how fashion and food issues of sustainability actually have a lot in common. So our guest speaker today, Sally, is actually going to talk to us about how all of us can start a sustainable initiative from our own home and from our own passion. She's a very great example of that. Um, many people we talk to are either professionals that are trained or experienced in the sustainability field. Uh, but Sally is really leading by example. She's turned her personal passion into, into a whole journey and initiative, uh, recently even taking time off her study to pursue it. She's only 21 years old, um, and during the lockdown in the UK, she started upcycling clothes brands, an upcycling clothes brand, sorry. She's taking unused and unwanted clothing and materials, and she turns them into fashionable pieces that people actually want to wear. So she increases the lifespan of the materials and reduces waste from new ones. She's moving towards a circular economy and believes that this is the way to go. And she's trying to help the process with her small business. So thank you so much for joining us, Sally. For the next 30 minutes, we're going to jump into the world of sustainable fashion with you, uh, looking at issues of waste and circularity from a whole new perspective that has a lot, of, uh, a lot in common with food. So without further ado, um, Sally, I'll pass it on to you to start with your talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, let me just share my screen. Oh, there we go. Um, is that all right? Can you see the presentation? You're all set, yes. Hi, so um, I just want to say thank you so much for that really kind introduction and thank you to the host for having me today and giving this opportunity. It's kind of the first time I've done anything like this, so please bear with me and we'll see how we get on. Um, right, so good morning or afternoon, evening, wherever you guys are in the world. I hope you're having a really good day. Uh, firstly, a little bit about me. My name's Sally Thorpe and I'm 21. I'm originally from the Isle of Wight, which is kind of the southest of the English coast. Um, but for the past two years, I've spent most of my time at university in Leeds, studying at business marketing with management. Um, when the first UK lockdown came, my whole course, including exams, coursework, everything was canceled and I was left with pretty much nothing to do. This is kind of where Upcycle Apparel began. Um, during that first lockdown, I was really, really bored. Um, like I said, I had nothing to do apart from maybe like sunbathe. I was kind of twiddling my thumbs a little bit. Um, I'd been doing some internet shopping and I found a top that I loved from one of my favorite brands at the time. Um, however, it was kind of out of my pricing range. So I decided to try my hand at making something similar. Obviously, I'm sure you guys can probably remember around this time. It was when TikTok became really big. And there was lots of like DIY sort of make it your own videos. So I guess that was probably like a bit of inspiration as well. Um, having never used a sewing machine before, I began messing around, kind of experimenting a bit with my mums. And in the end, I created the top. You can actually see it in the middle photo um, from a pair of old jeans. I sent some of my friends pictures of it and received like really, really positive feedback. Um, I think for me, this was kind of like a light bulb moment that maybe this could actually become something, creating new clothes from old ones. I then handed out leaflets around my area a bit. And luckily for me, it seemed everyone had been doing huge wardrobe cleanouts. So I received like bags and bags of clothing. Um, from there, I continued to experiment a bit and then made an Instagram and the business grew from that, that point onwards. 
Um, we now have a reasonable following on social media as well as a website and two other creators who I've just taken on. Um, they're lovely girls who help with the upcycling as well. And um, like mentioned before, I'm currently about to start a placement year out of my university degree, um, working on growing the brand. I in no way call myself an expert or anything close to one. However, I found, well, I kind of fell upon something I was interested in and I'm gradually trying to turn it into something a bit bigger than just myself. Um, one thing I found really, really interesting is that before Upcycle Apparel, I'd never really discussed the issue of sustainable fashion versus fast fashion with my friends. However, ever since I've had so many conversations and it's been really, really interesting to hear everyone's opinions on the subject. Um, <clears throat> sorry, you might ask, why is this necessary? Why is it important that we that we rework clothing? Like a lot of people, I used to shop fast fashion and was completely unaware of the impact it was having on the world. In case anyone's a bit unsure, fast fashion is those brands who mass produce clothing cheaply and quickly. It's known for constantly being up to date with new trends and they produce literally all of their items like ridiculously fast speeds. According to the Fast Company, clothing companies make around 53 million tonnes of clothing annually, with fashion being the third highest polluting industry on the planet. Other research tells us that most people have at least four items in their wardrobe that they never wear, and that nearly three-fifths of all clothing produced ends up in incinerators or landfills within years of being made. Fast fashion brands are constantly churning out new clothes and new styles to stay up to date with trends. This then obviously encourages the buyer to purchase them. I know when I go on a shop, I'll see new stuff and I'll be like, oh, I have to get it. Um, this is where we have our issue of misplacement. There are too many clothes being made, therefore too many not being worn and too many being thrown away. This is a growing issue and has been for a while. However, recently it's become more of a, like, a public issue with increasing amounts of people being aware of the fact. This in itself is obviously a very good thing, but also a bad thing. One negative effect that comes from it is brands greenwashing. Um, so greenwashing is something we all need to look out for. It's a tactic that brands use to appear more sustainable than they actually are. They often do this by making vague statements or facts about their impact on the environment, which can be interpreted by their audience um, in a better way than what the reality actually is. Um, another example may be a brand releasing a small sustainable line and then marketing themselves as a green brand, while most of their income and profits will be made by their main, like their main unsustainable lines. However, there are also brands who are doing like loads for the environment. Patagonia, for example, is and has been for a while a great ambassador for sustainable fashion, with the majority of their clothes being made from recycled materials. One of Patagonia's recent ad campaigns encourages their consumers to only buy what they need with the catchphrase, don't buy this jacket. This is another way that Patagonia are socially responsible and they make all of their products for durability as well as offering a repair and reuse section. Obviously, this is like key to aiming towards a circular economy. Um, so a circular economy revolves around reducing and eventually removing inputs and outputs. This means we are constantly reusing the materials we already have. There are different ways of doing this, as you can see from the diagram it mentions, renting, reusing, repairing, redesigning and reselling. Um, already we have seen a major increase in secondhand purchasing, especially over lockdown, with the rise of sites such as Depop and Vinted. There is also an increase in services that offer renting outfits or designer clothes instead of buying your own. These are all really, really good as it keeps the clothes in circulation rather than just for example, buying and wearing a dress once before it ends up in landfill. Um, sometimes an item will become overworn and needs fixing. Obviously, you can't sell something on when it's in that state. Um, so this is where repairing and redesigning comes in. Um, so it helps extend the life of that item of clothing um, and also where upcycle power comes in. Um, sometimes clothes have wear and tear or simply just aren't in style anymore and therefore won't, won't be worn. Through redesigning these items, we can turn something that no one would touch into an item that everybody wants. That means that the fabric doesn't leave the system as waste. Instead, it goes back to the design and produce stage before going through all of the steps again in like that circular motion. As the fashion industry is becoming more and more transparent, 
and there is increased focus on the sustainability side. I think that looking towards the food industry for guidance is a good idea. Obviously, this is what a lot of these episodes have been on. Um, for example, we could think about where is the fair trade for fashion? Uh, could we potentially set up a system where garment workers get similar benefits to those working on fair trade farms or similar? Um, people have been interested in where their food comes for a while now, but we need to be able to encourage them to be as interested in where their clothes are coming from or where the materials for those clothes are coming from. Um, all of these are obviously really interesting questions. Um, data tells us that 60% of people want to move away from fast fashion and also have an interest in learning more about what they can do to help. Um, this is a very good statistic. However, I'm aware that we're still quite a distance away from creating that circular fashion industry. Um, but I think everyone can think about what they can do to help. Um, so not everyone has the means or the time to be redesigning their own clothes or constantly listing items on an app to resell. However, there are always things that you can be doing to reduce your impact and encourage a circular environment. Um, donating unused clothes to charity shops, um, handing them down to a friend, even potentially donating to a company such as Upcycle Apparel is a way to continue your clothes lives. Encouraging a circular economy also just, it's not just about fashion. Finding uses for your waste, for want of a better word, can apply to all parts of your life. For example, um, you could take your yogurt pots, plant seedlings in them, or take an old coffee mug, fill it with wax, and turn it into a, an ornate candle holder. Um, I recently read a quote from architect Duncan Baker Brown that goes, there's no such thing as waste, just stuff in the wrong place. And I think that's an amazing way to look at it. For me, this whole thing has been such a learning curve, and I'm continued, continuing to adapt to running my own business as well as learning about the industry as I go. Um, so yeah, it was a short one from me, but thank you so much for listening. I hope that you found it reasonably interesting and um, please don't hesitate to get in touch and I'd really appreciate any follows on our social media so you can keep up with where we're going now. Um, fingers crossed this should be quite a big year for Upcycle Apparel and I would love to take any questions you have. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sally, for that presentation. That was uh, really, really interesting to see where your motivation came from and also how COVID somehow played a role, boredom <laughs> played a role in this. It's, it's kind of interesting. I think I heard just recently that uh, when we're bored, that's when we're also kind of most creative and we come up with some of the best ideas. So it seems like you've experienced that. Um, I mean, a lot of the things that you've said are of course resonate with us quite a lot and and they come back to the conversations that we had starting from talking about you know reducing and reusing we've seen that when we talked about the pyramid um, of food waste management those should always be the first um, choices when yeah. when we can't avoid waste but of course we should always try to avoid it in the first place and um, I mean love that you you know, touched upon fair trade for garment workers. And, and maybe we can, you know, discuss a little bit about what you know and how you see the issue there. Um, this is also the moment to remind the audience that please do drop your questions for Sally in the comment section or in the chat, depending on where you're, you know, watching us from. You're more than welcome to do so. We still have around 15 minutes to, to chat. So in the meantime, why don't I get started? Uh, we have a particular interest in, in what you're doing. We think it's really, really cool. And now it's a it's a homegrown business, right? So why don't you yeah. tell us a little bit more about how you're um how you're gonna bring it up to a bigger scale if that's the plan. I know now you've been joined by more people, which is awesome. Yeah. yeah so like I mentioned before, I've kind of started what I call the creator scheme. Um, mm -hmm. So it's taking on other students or young fashion designers who then help with the upcycling part of it. Obviously, that's great for the business because it means we can do more at like a quicker pace. But it's also really good for the students because it gives them a chance to get experience as well as earning a bit of money. It's also the way that I've structured it is it's very flexible hours. So it's like purposely made so they can fit it around their studies. So it's not like there's a lot of pressure for them to do it. They can kind of do it when they've got the time. So um, that's obviously great for them. We're also looking into sustainable fabrics as well. Obviously, I know I've been talking about a closed system, 
but at the at the stage that us and the industry is at at the moment i think it's important to also be looking at other fabrics instead of using reusing just the same ones over and over again so um we're currently working on a summer range that is going to be made out of um sustainable fabrics amazing thanks and and may i ask your client base right now is it based mostly in the uk or um are you also shipping internationally oh, can you hear me okay sally you just froze a little bit oh no worry or not <laughs> It's okay. If you can hear me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I was just asking a little bit about your customer base, if it is uh, for the moment mostly in the UK or if you're able to ship internationally and have an audience internationally as well. Yeah, so currently a lot of it is in the UK. Obviously, um, we're working on a smaller scale at the moment. So mm -hmm. I haven't been offering international posters just because it's quite hard to work out at the beginning how much it's going to be and also what the demand is going to be in other countries. Mm -hmm. um, but that is one of the things that is on our list to get sorted because I can see the location of everyone who goes on the website and a lot of them are from abroad. So I think that's something that we really need to bring in soon. Amazing. Yeah, it's cool to see that there's interest also outside the UK. Awesome. Yeah. So we're hoping, of course, we being based in Hong Kong, we're hoping to see international shipping soon. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the next question that I wanted to ask, clearly you touched upon a little bit towards the end when you gave us some pointers and some suggestions on how we can be more sustainable when thinking about fashion. Um, I wonder if you have like some tips and tricks for people to you know try it at home doing what you do and really upcycle our wardrobe yeah yeah so um when i first started like i mentioned i'd never used a sewing machine before like i, I wasn't a big sewer obviously i've done art and things in the past but you don't have to be that creative to be able to like make your clothes nicer I remember in lockdown, a lot of people were embroidering stuff on their clothes or some of my mm -hmm. friends used to paint designs and stuff. So like a black pair of jeans, for example, you might want to snazz them up a bit, maybe paint like, I don't know, white flowers or something. Um, so it's really easy to do that, obviously. And then for sewing as well, I think it is, it is um, like experimenting is quite important. For me, when I started, I just made what I kind of saw. Like like I said at the beginning, I copied a top yeah. um, and just looked at what they'd done and then kind of made it into my own sort of style. So it is really easy. And also, like I mentioned as well, it doesn't have to just be clothing. It could be a lot of, a lot of other things as well. So um, yeah, honestly, it's easy to do at home. I encourage everyone to do it. Amazing. Yeah, it's kind of cool how pretty much everyone we've talked to during this series, the importance of doing things your own, you know, and trying things out and using whatever creativity you have to really see the value in, I mean, food or in the conversations we had, but in this case, in like clothing and and uh, and garments, it's, it's pretty awesome. So we might we might give it a try. Oh, we have a question coming through. Um, do you think upcycled fashion should get the same attention that food upcycling does? Um, well, thank you for your question. I, um, I think they should kind of go hand in hand slightly. Obviously, I know more about upcycled fashion than I do food upcycling. But um, food upcycling, in my opinion at least, has been in the public eye a lot more for like a longer period of time, as in people have compost bins and have for a while, things like that. Whereas upcycled fashion, it hasn't been like big news for that long. Um, so I think it should probably at least get the same amount. If not, ooh, I don't want to say more obviously, but um, I think it needs more people talking about it, let's say. Agreed. And I think, you know, it goes back to the, the issue of connection with food. If you have like food waste or food leftover, the perception is kind of immediate because it literally it rots in your house, right? Like you have to get it quickly. With clothing, it's easy to let stuff sit in your wardrobe for some Forget time. about it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you want to do your spring cleaning and just think that you can 
yeah, that you can throw it away like that. And they're out of fashion. You talked about fast fashion as well, right? And how yeah. um, these brands are pretty much made to create new styles and new demand. So our things get out of fashion really, really quickly. Um, I, if I can comment, I also think we have to learn to let styles last for longer, right? And then let them yeah. be nice. And things will come back in style as well. Yeah, exactly. I did, oh my God. So this is a good example. I was, you must have been much younger because you're 21. But when I was around 12 or 13, uh, we had the bell shaped trousers coming, yeah. coming into fashion. And I remember my mom being so upset because they were kind of expensive to buy for me, but she used to wear them back in the 70s. Yeah. Right? And we were exactly the same size. And she kept on saying, had I just kept them, had I just kept them for yeah. you, you the perfect trousers. Yeah, so exactly. perfect example. Oh, okay. We have um, more questions coming through. So um, are the clothes you make based on fashion that you prefer or is it your own style? Yes. Yeah, so obviously at the beginning I started just making clothes for myself like I didn't I hadn't I didn't start with the idea of creating a brand so at that point I was just making stuff for myself and I don't think I would ever make anything that I personally wouldn't buy if I saw it in a shop just because you know I don't want to sound up myself but I kind of back my fashion sense a little bit um, so I feel like other people would probably like stuff if I liked it obviously depending on who you are that is um, but yeah, so I guess the brand is my own fashion um, and my own style to an extent. But now that we have the um, upcycle creators as well, they make stuff which is their, their style as well. So now there's a bit more of a mix of mine and theirs. So it will continue to grow, but it definitely started as just my own style. Amazing. That's going to be an interesting transition for you, I think, to start yeah, doing, yeah. You know, in your own shop, things that you might have never thought of, but it's also the nice thing about having creatives on board, I guess. Yeah. Um, more questions coming through. So thanks for the great talk. The main downside with upcycling uh, that I have seen is the convenience of fast fashion, that's true. Um, how do you get people interested if they don't really care about sustainability? Um, so luckily for me, um, sustainability is a trend now. And especially over lockdown, there was major increases in the amount of people who either wanted to learn about sustainability or said that they'd rather buy from a sustainable brand over a non-sustainable brand mm -hmm. but um obviously there is some people who don't care about sustainability and that's where i just have to make sure that the clothes are actually nice that they would buy them even if they weren't sustainable that they they just want that pair of trousers and the fact that it's sustainable is a, like a positive benefit like it doesn't, it's not the thing that sells it to them. But obviously I'd, it would be better if everyone cared about sustainability, but that's a work in progress, I'd say. Absolutely. So is that part of your brand as well to try to educate your audience about the sustainability aspect? Or um, are you more, like you said, it's an added benefit. Are you more staying on that, keeping it as an added benefit instead? Um, well, obviously, I market myself as a sustainable brand. Mm. Um, I want them to be good stars as well. I want it to be the mixture. Sometimes you see sustainable brands, which obviously they're amazing for the environment, but the actual style is probably a bit boring or something. Um, but I'm hoping to add a section to the website as well, kind of like a blog post and get different people on it. It doesn't necessarily have to be about fashion. It could be about other forms of upcycling or recycling. So it's like an education section to the website, but that is a work in progress as well. That's amazing. Okay, I didn't know about the blog. We should check it out. Yeah, that was a, that was, that's a new part I just thought of a few days ago. So. <laughs> great, great, we'll check it out for sure. Awesome. Um, Anaita also put a question through. Do you think certain fashion brands use the sustainability label just so that they can be seen as environmentally friendly? How does one judge the authentic authenticity, sorry, of sustainable fashion? Yeah, so like I mentioned before, that is completely greenwashing. Um, a lot of brands do that. I don't want to name names, but um, there's certain things you can look out for. So like I mentioned, if they have a small sustainable range, 
um, that doesn't mean the rest of their stuff is sustainable. Or um, if, I'm trying to think of a better example now, um, they might say that something, some of their actions are greener than they are. So they might say they've reduced their carbon emissions by 50% but they're still putting billions and billions of tons into the environment. So you kind of have to read between the lines a little bit. Um, obviously, that's just something that you learn to do. Like, I probably make mistakes sometimes with brands I buy as well, thinking that it's better for the environment than it is. But, um, yeah, there's a lot, lots of tips online that you can look at, which gives you advice on how to judge them. Yeah, and I think it's hard to navigate as well, right? Because, like you yeah. said, big brands well what might look like a, a big green label within those big brands it's actually probably just a small portion of all that they do um, yeah. to them it's probably convenient <laughs> to have it but not so much for the environment so it's really hard to monitor and i guess one of the things that we found out might help answer this question that we found out during the series is to you know try to buy a little bit more locally and small size because you usually get a little bit more visibility on what they do uh, and it's more personable and you might literally just know more about the business and the people that are in yeah, it so in your case it's a great example right um yeah that's that's fantastic thanks everyone for for these amazing questions and i guess before we finish i had another question that i this is a little bit of my personal interest as well i'm trying to buy sustainable fashion here and there try it a few um what i believe are sustainable brands maybe one day i'll find out they're not <laughs> we'll see uh, but i think one of the really cool things that are happening and you touched upon before um and i know you're getting into that are uh you know like sustainable uh fabrics and there's quite a few of them that are made out of food or food waste um i have a backpack here that has parts made of like apple fake leather, for example, and then yeah. nylon and, and things like that. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your choice to get in, into that and also other things that we should look out for when we hear sustainable fabric? Yeah, so um, I think sustainable fabrics are great. And obviously it is quite a work in progress. Like there's lots of research going into it at the moment um, that hasn't been put in before. So it is a learning curve for everyone who's doing it. But um, what I've chosen to go with, it's called Tensil Lilacell. It's quite hard to say. I get it wrong sometimes. But um, it's basically made out of tree pulp, um, which is from trees that have already been cut down from forests that are purposely made for that process. So it's not like bad deforestation. Um, and it does use a chemical in the process to break it down, which obviously isn't that great. But the way that um, they do it is that 99% of that chemical, every time they use it to break down that tree pulp, is put straight back into the system. So apart from that 1%, which is lost every time, um, it is basically a closed circuit um, production process, which is one of the things that was really important to me when I was looking at them. I know that with a lot of other sustainable fabrics, they sound incredible. Um, there was one that I was reading about the other day, I think it's called Pinna Tax or something. It's made out of pineapples, kind of like a leather substitute. And um, it sounds amazing, obviously, on paper, but then they use um, petrol to make it, which obviously you have to look at the process that they're using to create the materials, because sometimes the materials sound amazing, but they might be using things that are then a waste product afterwards. Um, so I think that's something that you need to look out for quite a lot with the sustainable materials sort of coming in now. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that's that's really interesting about uh, peanut tech. I, I didn't know that, for example. And it just brings to my mind another confusion that I see happen quite a lot between, especially with leather, right? There's quite a lot on leather substitutes and some of them are vegan, but vegan doesn't necessarily mean sustainable because the focus is on not yeah. animals, right? Uh, but then what's the point if we're putting out in the environment, you know, chemicals yeah. that damage animal life at the end of the day? It's, it's not great either. So thanks for sharing that. And 
I guess the bottom line for everyone is we have to do our research, be patient. I mean, some of our speakers also said it, be patient also with yourself. It's kind of normal to make mistakes. It's a, it's a yeah, yeah, easy to navigate. So thanks for your tips, Sally. Thanks a lot. Um, I think at this point, we've gone through all the questions and we're just a little bit over time. So I'm kind of happy with the timing today. I want to thank you so much for joining us, you know, as our last guest speaker. Yeah, as well. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for making the time. And of course, we wish you all the best with Upcycle Apparel and um, hopefully Hopefully, hopefully we'll see you soon again. Thanks everyone for tuning in. This is the second last episode. Next week, it's just gonna be me and my colleague, Savina, but we're gonna do a nice wrap up of what we've learned in these past, well, six months actually. It's been quite a long <laughs> journey. And um, yeah, kind of just like summarize all the best moments and best learnings. So tune in and don't forget to fill out our feedback form. With the feedback form, not only you give us amazing feedback and we try to do things better, but you also stand the chance to win $150 on our web shop. And um, that is all. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks again, Sally. Until next time. Bye, everyone.